Today's Palm Sunday. This is uh, the church calendar's day of remembering Jesus riding triumphantly, yeah, triumphantly into Jerusalem. How many of you feel triumphant today? How many of you feel, okay, let's ask it down. How many of you are winners out there? Okay, how many of you are losers? <laughs> okay. You might feel like a loser, but you're not a loser. Amen. You're a winner with Jesus every time. That's the bottom line. With Jesus, you're a winner every time. I want to take a look a little bit about, you see on the front of your bulletin, it says, who's responsible? And we're going to take a look at responsibility. Who's responsible? Are you responsible? And you'll say, well, Pastor, that depends upon what you're talking about. Is it good stuff? If it's good stuff, sure, I'm responsible. If it's bad stuff, she's responsible. <laughs> or he's responsible. We're going to take a look at Matthew, Matthew chapter 27. And uh, we're going to take a look at Pilate. We're going to take a little bit look at Jesus. The people, who are the people, who's responsible? And so we'll, we'll take a look at those scripture readings that, uh, that had Ben had just uh, read. We want to take a little bit of a look about it. And rather than reading the whole thing about yeah, that Matthew has recorded. I'm going to do some paraphrasing, okay? You can follow along. It's Matthew chapter 27. Jesus is taken before Pilate. And Pilate asks Jesus, do you hear all these accusations? They say, are you the, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus simply responds, you say so. That's it. Pilate goes, that's it? What about all these accusations? You know, you have anything to say? You're, you know, you're, your life is in my hands. Your life is on trial here. You have nothing to say? And Jesus says nothing else. Well, that's a fulfillment of the Old, prophet, Old Testament prophecy. If he was led as a lamb to the slaughter, not opening his mouth. We, in our culture today, whether it's Philippines or Korea, the United States, Iran, wherever you're from, I'll bet it's your culture to stand up and say, I've got rights. How many of you ever heard that? You're in violation of my rights. You can't do that. We usually do that with policemen when they get a little aggressive. You can't touch me. You can't do that. My rights. My rights have been violated. I'm going to get a lawyer. I'm going to sue you. Isn't that what we say? Really? We demand our rights. You know, when people go to court and say, well, you can't have that cross there. It's on public property, and you can't have that cross there anymore. And all these Christians rallied to the courthouse. We demand our rights. Well, take a look a little bit at what Jesus did. Nothing. I think we sometimes get it a little bit backwards. After all, Jesus is pretty quiet. When the guards are mocking him and making a crown of thorns and slamming, hey, that, those thorns are from the Holy Land, and they're sharp. <laughs> Just putting that under, I got picked a couple of times. 
and it hurts. And they jammed it on his head. And Jesus says, nothing. They spit in his face. They blindfold him. They hit him with sticks and taunt him and say, Ha! Messiah, sure. Then tell us who hit you. Wow. He says, Nothing. I think sometimes we as Christians take things too personally. Here we see Jesus did not take it personally. He didn't say, hey, I know it was you, Centurion. I know you hit me. And I know you hit me with a stick and it's made out of briarwood. Or it's made out of oak. And I can tell you that tree was 233 years old from which it was taken. And I can tell you that neither your wife nor your three children nor your girlfriend are going to be pleased with what's happening. He didn't say any of that. He didn't say, you know what? You wait. You're going to make my father angry enough and he's going to have all the angels come down and you're going to be defeated. He didn't say that. He didn't say, wait till I come back. Uh, I'll be back. Uh, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger. <laughs> I saw a bumper sticker once and it said, Jesus is coming. And he's mad. That's not true. And Jesus will come again as the judge. Amen. Righteous judge. Infallible. But who's responsible for Jesus' death? You ever think about that? A lot of Christians say, well, you know, it's all them Jews, you know, they killed them. Them Pharisees. They're the ones who have cited, cited the, the crowd against, against Jesus. Wait a minute. Let's see. This crowd who on oh, Palm Sunday, a few days earlier, welcomes Jesus, is hailing him. Matter of fact, they say, just like we did in our responsive reading, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna! Wow, they're shouting so loud, they're making such a ruckus, the Pharisees come over there and say, hey, you're creating a, a, a disturbance. You're creating a riot, Jesus. Tell these people to be quiet because they're just praising and worshiping God. They're praising and worshiping Jesus of Nazareth, the one who healed all diseases, who just raised, just down the road, Bethany, about three, four miles down the road, Lazarus. This man, Lazarus, he was dead. We saw it with our own eyes. Four days he was in the grave. Jesus comes and he brings him back to life. Well, they wanted to kill Jesus. They, now they want to kill Lazarus again. They wanted to kill him. But the people are praising. Jesus says, hey, you know what? If I tell these people to be quiet, those rocks themselves will start praising. Whew. So maybe it's those Pharisees, right? They're, they're responsible for Jesus' death. I've heard a lot of Christians say, oh, you remember it's in the Bible? Yeah. They called for his death. They told Pilate, crucify him, crucify him. Let his blood be on our hands and on our heads and on our children and on their children's children. Right? So it must have been their fault, right? They're responsible. They're the ones who killed him. Where was that crowd that was praising God, worshiping him when he rode into Jerusalem? And now the crowds that are with him are with the Pharisees and they're saying, Crucify him right along with the Pharisees. So maybe it's those people to blame. Maybe it's Pilate. When Pilate's questioning him, he knows Jesus didn't do anything worth, worthy of death. He says, look here, Jesus, I'm trying to help you. Give me something. Let me. No, he's saying this. How many of you heard this one? Help me. Help you. I was away from Jerry McGuire a long time ago. Help me. Help you. Give me something, Jesus. Help me to defend you. I know you're innocent. 
I know you've done nothing worthy of death. Help me. Help you. And Jesus, by saying his answer, are you the king of the Jews? You say so. Jesus isn't saying, see, that's the, that's the beauty of it. Jesus doesn't make you believe anything. But he does tell you to choose. You decide. You decide. That's what he's really telling Pilate. You have a decision to make, Pilate. Well, Pilate's own wife says, comes to Pilate and she says, Woohoo, this Jesus of Nazareth, don't have anything to do with him. I've been bothered by this dream all day. I'm telling you, husband. Of course, husbands never listen to their wives anyway, do they? Leave him alone. Have nothing to do with him. And Pilate's reaction is, man, I've done just about everything I can. To, okay, let me see. I'm going to have him beat. I'm going to have him beaten. Maybe they'll have compassion in on how severely he gets beaten. Maybe they'll feel sorry for him and then they'll let him go. Maybe that'll appease the people. So let me try to appease the people. And so he has him beaten, flogged. And it's pretty gory details. And Matthew kind of omits all the gory details because to the people that Matthew is writing to in those days, they knew exactly what that punishment was like. They knew the gore because they probably witnessed it on more than one occasion. They knew what was going to happen in when someone was crucified. They've seen it before. After all, their roads were lined with them on left and on the right of crucified bodies. Matthew didn't have to go into detail. So maybe this was all Herod's fault. He, he knew he was innocent. He could have let him go. He tries to appease the people and tries to change their mind and so he has this innocent man tortured. And then in the hopes of having a crowd that would take compassion, he says, here he is, you see, here. And the people are still calling out what? Crucify him. No mercy. No compassion. So now it's the crowd's fault again. Or maybe it's the Pharisees' fault because they incited the crowd. Or maybe it's their fault because they're joining in with the people. Huh. What do you think? Whose fault is it? Then Pilate says, as they're yelling, crucify him. Crucify him. He says, bring me some water. I'm going to wash my hands. I'm innocent of this man's blood. You know, the funny thing about it is when, in the Old Testament, when they sacrificed, when they made a sacrifice, they didn't wash their hands until after the sacrifice was done. Then they would wash their hands. Pilate couldn't even be clean of Jesus' blood by doing it ceremonially or symbolically. He did it the wrong way anyway. He didn't wait for Jesus to be sacrificed. So is it Pilate again? Oh, well, maybe it's the people. Uh, maybe it's the Pharisees. Or maybe it's all of them. We as Christians, we look back at that day of, of, of the torture, of the trial. Man, how unfair. We probably even get a little angry. Yeah, them Jews, it's the Jews' fault. They crucified Jesus. We like to distance ourselves. We don't want to take any blame in it. We don't want to take any part of that. We like to, oh, it's those people. 
How about today? How do we react when the world's got plenty of problems, doesn't it? <laughs> the world's got a lot of problems. How about in Iran, where they're persecuting Christians, where they're going out and if you've got a Muslim name and you're in one of those underground churches they happen to raid and your paperwork says, my name's Muhammad, and you were in a Christian home church, guess what? You disappear. You get tortured. You go to prison. Some people never see you again. And what do the Christians do? Uh, do we protest? Do we pray? Are we at all actively engaged in seeking justice? Or do we just seek justice by means of courts and lawyers? Or do we stand up and do we have a voice? It's all right. I was thinking, is that you, God? <laughs> Don't we have problems in our, own play, in our own countries, no matter what countries, where the poor are oppressed? They're treated as somehow less than anybody else with any money. Aren't the people with money and fame and things treated better than someone who doesn't have it? And yet, do we say anything? How about people who are suffering injustice? And that's all around the world. When's the last time you prayed for someone suffering from injustice? Does it bother you? At the Ivory Coast, Nigeria, Liberia, where they have tribes massacring tribes. Nigeria, where the northern population will come into a Christian town and kill everyone. Hack off limbs, arms, rape. Does that bother you? It seems like we try to be like Jesus for all the wrong reasons. And we open not our mouths. Do we stand up for Jesus? Do we defend Jesus? I would ask you then, does your life show it? Does your behavior show what you believe? What do you do when someone accuses you of wrongdoing? Do you explode in anger and say, that's not so, that's not true, I've got rights, you're wrong, I'm going to sue you for slander? How do you react? We love that. I got rights. I got rights. How do you? How are you like Jesus? What do you do when you're faced with all kinds of trials and temptations? Because I want to th throw in another category of people in here. Not just Pilate, not just the Pharisees, and not just the crowds that were there. Who's responsible for Jesus' death? Matthew doesn't hang Pilate with all of the guilt and all of the responsibility. Matthew doesn't hold all of the Pharisees as solely responsible. Not even all the crowds of people who were one day 
shouting praises and worshiping Jesus as he comes in and a couple days later shouting for his crucifixion, his death. No, Matthew doesn't hang it all on them either. You see, each one of us, each one of them had a decision to make. You have the same decision. Is Jesus who he says he is? Or was he just a nice guy? Or was he just misunderstood? Or was Jesus who he really said he was? The Son of God. They had to make a decision. And you need to make one too. It's human beings that make decisions about Jesus. And God lets them. You know what? Maybe it's God's fault. Maybe it's God's fault. Maybe God's responsible for Jesus' death. After all, God didn't do anything to stop it. God seems so weak and powerless and vulnerable. The cross of Christ reveals a God who loved the world so much that he was willing to give himself in the form of his son. Where there is love, there's vulnerability. Did you know that? It takes a risk to love someone. Did you know that? You probably already, if you're married, you probably already figured it out that uh, love isn't always pleasant that there is sacrifice with love it's not only you don't always get your way with love love costs did you know that get married you will I see husbands poking their wives and wives poking their husbands there are risks involved in love Oh man, if, if I turn my cheek to the guy who just gossiped about me, he might hit me again, gossip about me again. Oh, he just took credit for my work. Oh, maybe I won't say anything, but if I don't say anything, then he's going to do it again. Jesus decided to act in love and got slapped to death. Jesus, Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr., they all decided to use peaceful means rather than swords and guns to fight for human dignity. And they were clobbered. Who killed Jesus? Who's responsible? Who are the guilty? Maybe that's the wrong question to ask. Maybe I should ask this question. Who's not guilty? How about his disciples who kind of like went, they fled, they were scared. I think the truth is that Matthew is getting here is we are all guilty. That's the bottom line. We're all guilty. The Bible says that over and over again. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There's none, not, none righteous. No, not one. Our righteousness to God is as filthy rags. Oh, but I wasn't right there. Well, you know, if we were there, we'd either be hiding or we'd be shouting right along with the crowd. Either way, we would have denied Jesus 
and been guilty. We are guilty because we are sinful. We say, well, it was God's fault. He could have done anything and he could have stopped it anytime he wanted, so it's God's fault. No, God didn't make human beings crucify his son. He gave the human beings the opportunity to choose Jesus. Actually, Pilate tries to give him another way out, didn't he? Hey, about this, I got a good idea. How about if I give you Barabbas? You know, this murderer? Surely you people wouldn't take this rebel cause and murdering scoundrel. You wouldn't want to release him into your society rather than Jesus. After all, he didn't do anything. And so he presents them this choice. And the people say, we want Barabbas. We want Barabbas. What do you choose? Who do you choose? In your life, when things aren't going your way, in your life, when temptation, you relinquish, you go ahead and succumb to, you choose to do sin rather than righteousness. You're choosing to do that. I've heard people say, the devil made me do it. No. If you're a Christ follower, the devil can't make you do anything. The Bible's real clear that you have been freed from the power of the devil. Freed from the power of sin. You do have control. You do have a choice. Who do you choose? What do you choose? So this message today is to get us to think. Stop thinking of everybody else as being at fault. Oh, she made me so angry, that's why I... You fill in the blank. We try and justify our own sin. You know what? No matter how much we try and rationalize it, no matter how much we try to defend our actions of sin, we're still guilty. It's not just the Jews, the Pharisees, the Roman soldiers, Pilate, the governor. There was a man who had a vision or a dream about Jesus' death. He said, I saw the Roman soldier as they held Jesus to the cross. And the Roman soldier with his helmet and his armor and his sandals, his sword in his side by his side and a spear, who took this big hammer and a large spike and drove it as he watched this Roman soldier drive the nails in Jesus' hand. Going through his hand and into the wooden cross. He was astonished. When that Roman soldier turned his head and looked at him, what astonished him so much, what startled him, was that he was that soldier. We are all guilty of sin. We made choices. But the good news is 
that the world wouldn't really consider this a victorious or triumphal entry into Jerusalem. But God is not like the world. This is a victorious entry on Palm Sunday because Jesus himself overcomes sin, defeats the devil, and gives us, you and I, if we accept his sacrifice, eternal life. Then we too have victory. Death has no power over us. Sin has no power over us. And the devil sure doesn't. We are victorious with the king who rode into Jerusalem. You see the purple color? The purple color represents royalty. It represents victory. And we who were guilty are covered, white, washed clean, slates clean because of the king's death and suffering. We too, as his children, share in his inheritance. That's the great news. Did we deserve death? Yep. Do we deserve death? Yes. But for the blood of Jesus, for the sacrifice, we sing a song that my king would die for me. Amazing grace. Do you accept his gift that will free you from the consequence of sin? Do you choose Jesus? I pray that you do. Time is short. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. I may be gone tonight. Hallelujah. And that would be okay with me. And you all better have a party when I'm gone. Because I'm rejoicing. I'm rejoicing. I'm going to be so happy. So blessed. That I'm not even going to be thinking about you. Can you imagine that? That's selfish, but that's true. I'm not going to be thinking about you. Because I would feel sad that you all have to put up with this world and life in this world. I'd feel sad. But guess what? There's no sadness in heaven. So I'm not going to think about you. I'm going to be enjoying being with Jesus. Sorry. That's it. I'm going to be happy. When you go, you're not going to be thinking about me stuck here either if I'm, if I'm, if I'm still here. There is so much joy in heaven if you choose Jesus. If you choose Jesus, it doesn't matter what happens to you here. You know that? What's the worst anybody can do? You kill you, and then what happens? You're with Jesus. No more pain, no more suffering. There's no downside. Who's responsible? You are responsible. And I'm responsible. I'm not going to get to heaven because of what my mama taught me or what my mama believed. I'm not going to get to heaven for what my daddy did or didn't do. I'm going to get to heaven because of Jesus and I choose Him. How about you? Are you a winner? I pray you are. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you Lord, for not giving up on us. Man, sometimes I'm so hard. I, I'm so difficult to learn the lesson. Stop blaming other people. Stop condemning other people. Help us, Lord, to be more like Jesus. Sometimes we don't need to be so defensive and we don't need to be so boisterous about how somebody treated us. Rather, we can be more like you and they can see more of your love in us at times when we say absolutely nothing. And yet there are times when we need to encourage the weak, 
Seek justice for those who have been unjustly treated. The problem is, Lord, that we too were dead in our sins when Jesus, just at the right time, came, lived, and died for our sins that we might be free. And we are free indeed. We thank you, Lord, for riding triumphantly into Jerusalem. For being willing to be obedient to the Father. Even when it cost you everything. Help us, Lord, to be so empowered by your Holy Spirit. That we keep in step with your Spirit. No matter what the cost. That we would follow you. No matter what the cost. Because our present day of suffering and trials is nothing compared to the glorious riches that await for each one of us in heaven with you. We thank you for showing us the way, the truth, and the life. Worthy is the Lamb. For it's in his name. And for his sake that we pray. Amen.